Hey everybody, welcome back to the Beyond the Peloton podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Martin from the Beyond the Peloton newsletter with my usual co-host, Andrew Vons, a little busy due to his his newly launched company, The Better Lab. Check it out at thebetterlab.io. I am trying to fill in bonus episodes to make sure you guys get at least a semi-weekly shows and, and eliminate some of those longer gaps in between the, the main shows with both Andrew and I. And this week, we have Aisha Pratlier from the Jamaican National Track and Field Team. Team boss, running team, is that correct? That's correct. Olympian, Commonwealth Games champion, winner, 3,000 meter steeplechase. What year was that? 2018. 2018. I feel like it was yesterday. Me too. And Olympic hopeful for 2024. And most importantly, massive cycling fan, potentially a bigger cycling fan than I am. You, you may be, you're on the boards. Then that's, and that's, and that's why we're here. You're on the message boards on Twitter, on Reddit all the time. I try to block it out, but we brought you in. You got some hot takes. You called the Red Bull, I guess, rumors of Wout Van Aert, Remco, Tom Pickcock all coming home to Red Bull weeks before the media got a hold of it. So it's great to have you. I first just wanted to talk about, Andrew and I are always kind of blibber blabbering about like, oh, these guys, elite athletes, this is how they train, this is how they live. But we don't, you would not say have like the most firsthand experience of that. So would love to hear just a little bit about like your training, your lifestyle, how you think that relates to top track or not, sorry, top cyclist. And then we're going to debate about training. Like what made your, your coach, Joe, Joe Bossard has gotten really into cycling training. I'm convinced cycling training is a scam. No one knows what they're talking about. So we're going to debate how do these guys get so fast since running training seems to be like almost down to a science at this point. I feel like you could talk to 10 different cycling coaches and they would give you 10 different answers on how to get fast. But first up, tell us a little bit about your season. I don't know how public this is, but this is going to be your last pro running season. Is that correct? That's correct. And what events are you focusing on? Yes. So Olympic year, big year. I'm focusing on officially the 5K, but I still have sights on a side quest of the 1500. My first love of events. I did the steeplechase at the Olympics in Rio in 2016. And then in Tokyo 2021, I ran the 1500. It would be super cool to be uh, the first Jamaican woman to run the 5K at the Olympics and then have sort of the suite of um, middle distance events uh, that I've competed at the highest level. You don't see that very often. So I think that would be a, a very cool thing to do. But I still love the 1500. It's so hard. It's so fun. But officially 5K side quest of the 1500. I've. I don't know if I I'm, I feel like I'm remembering this correctly. Did you finish like top five at the world championships in the indoor 1500 yeah. at one point? Uh, I was sixth. Sixth. I was sixth. But it was actually a stacked year of what's really interesting about the women's 1500 is that it's the best it has ever been. We're living in um, the the best, deepest, most challenging fields. The world record has been broken a few times in my uh lifetime as an athlete and that doesn't really happen very often um but yeah so i was six that world indoors in a very 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 stacked field which was pretty sweet that's and that was like a side quest at the time you were yeah. a professional steeplechaser yeah. and you're like i'm just gonna race the 1500 yeah. for an off-season workout yeah i was getting ready for commonwealth games which was in australia in 2018 and it was a world indoor year and we had been training up at super high altitude in crested butte which is around 9,000 feet of elevation and had some really nice days of weather. We had access to an indoor track, which we don't have in Boulder. And we were doing, doing a little bit of an indoor season and I had made a, a massive jump and was running sort of world-class times and beating very, very good athletes in my two indoor races. And we thought like, ah, what the heck, let's try to go to world indoors and see how it goes. And I ended up six. That was really not part of the plan at all. I was just getting ready to steeple at Commonwealth Games. but it really catapulted my career to make me really think about s stopping running the steeple. The steeple is a, a long distance hurdles race and it's terrible on your body. Like anytime I get an MRI of either one of my feet, it comes back with showing up several stress fractures. Both my naviculars are broken. 
I don't feel any of this anymore because I've like worked so hard on on my body and getting everything stronger. But there's a reason why people don't steeple for <laughs> 15 years because it's it's really tough on your body. But then, you know, that year gave me the gift of re- running flat events and being pretty good at it. Yeah, yeah I'd say it worked out pretty well. It's, it's funny you mentioned uh, not having an indoor track. I think I think about this all the time. People would be shocked if they knew how top American based track athletes train. Like in college, it's so pampered. Like you would almost say probably the best facilities you would get anywhere in track and field. And then you graduate college. And like if people knew that Emma Coburn, you know, like international running superstar, and you were running on, you guys are basically poaching like middle school tracks, right? And you have to bounce around while yeah. they'll let you run on them. And then you have to go to a different middle school or a different high school. Yeah. So imagine being, we have 14 people on our team now and several people in the top 30, top 20, top 10 in the world and in the US at their job. And we don't have a bathroom to use at our workplace. That really <laughs> shocks people. <laughs> yeah. Track access. It's a, it's a weird, it's a weird deal, but we found a home at Niwot High School, which is, which has been great. And we've got some porta potties that our team and a couple other professional teams pay for. So we have a place <laughs> to go to the bathroom. It's, it's disgusting. But yeah, yeah. Professional, it, professional track athlete, athlete life is, I think, kind of similar to professional cyclist life. If I am basing this off of the time I spend on the internet looking and reading about cycling and also watching um, Unchained, which was, which was cool. But uh, to get into my training a little bit, I train right now about 13 hours a week. I've, I've been putting in 13 hours a week for the last 12 or 13 weeks. Um, I had a couple of weeks in there. I, I raced down in Chile at Pan American Games and unfortunately ended up hurting my heel. So I had three weeks there that I was only cycling for training. And I put in 18 and a half hour weeks then, which I was really excited. I was, I was flying over to Monaco and saw on Wout Strava that I was <laughs> actually ahead of him in minutes of cycling for the week. So that's one, my one claim to fame for this year's cycling training. But right now I run about in a seven day, seven day average looking prospect about 70 miles a week plus five, anywhere between four to six hours of cycling on top of that. And we have been experimenting with adding cross training in as a way to balance out the intensity of our training. Someone like me, I am the ripe age of 34 years old and I've run a lot in my life and my heart and my lungs want me to run 90 to 100 miles a week. I've done that in the past, but because I'm a more mature in age athlete, I will not say old. It, that's a lot of wear and tear. So I, I need to be a little bit smarter with the miles that I'm running and have them be more quality. And then I can add sort of low level cycling and to supplement that and we have the benefit of having a coach who is spends way too much time thinking about this stuff. And he is very, very, very scientific in the way that he approaches training. I was just showing Spencer his latest training book that he is is into. He's usually reading some sort of textbook and he's reading Inigo Mujica's book, Endurance Training, Science and Practice, second edition, which I was trying to figure out who is is that Magnus Court in the polka dots? This is a good question. This is like, <laughs> it's like really ambiguous. You know, I think it is Magnus Court because he has the Pac helmet. Yeah. And this, I mean, Magnus Court, hilarious guy, good writer. <laughs> the first three stages of that tour, what was that? That was, what must have been 2022 Two. when it was in Denmark. Yeah. And you're like, my one thesis about Denmark is very flat. <laughs> I think he got that KOM because he sprint. There was like one highway overpass that he sprinted up, and you're like, it was three days of extremely flat racing. And then now they have like a world tour. Denmark has a world tour race one day. I'm like, I don't know if I need to see more of Denmark. Yeah, like, yeah. They, I think I want to go visit. I want to go to Copenhagen. I don't know if I need to watch pro cyclists race around, but I guess it is really windy, so maybe they'll get some yeah. nice crosswinds there. But yeah, that's yeah. the that's the Jonas predicament. How did he get so good? Riding in the wind. Yeah, riding. Riding the wind. Yeah. Riding my my usual co-host Andrew Vance was like, 
you know, this was two years ago. He's like, where the hell did this guy come from? What was he just like riding around in fields? And then now he's winning the tour. And then he watched the Unchained documentary. And that is kind of what he was doing. Yeah. Just riding around. In the worst possible conditions. Yeah. 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 I mean, they have a lot of good riders. I actually would be curious. You see clustering like this in cycling where you'll have, you know, some, and sometimes it's EPO related. Like there was all these great Canadian mountain bikers in the nineties. And then you found out they were all just using EPO, but like Denmark and Norway are now like the hot places for cyclists. And 10 years ago, it was like the young Swedes were really good. And you kind of get these clustering of riders that are like good from the same country. And I don't really have an explanation for it. I mean, Lance Armstrong's theory was it's kind of simplistic, but it could be right where it just you see your countrymen doing well and you're like, oh, that guy can do it. I know I can do it. And then it kind of elevates everybody's game. If you can see it, you can be it 100%. Yeah. I really think that that has a lot to do with it. And the way that Magnus Court was celebrated during that during that tour, it's like, wow, this guy is hitting a cultural moment here. And how many little kids saw that? And then, you know, they think cycling is cool. And then, you know, if you have a bunch more people with access to this idea, then maybe they pick it up and inevitably there'll be kids with talent that are the ones picking up their bicycles from seeing that out in the world. Yeah. Yeah. And you guys are riding a lot. I mean, I, I do think it's a good idea because, you know, like both you and your husband will have feet problems. I'd imagine if I ran every day for 15, 20 years, I'd have pretty bad feet too. It's just the human foot isn't really designed to handle that. And just running is hard on your body. Cycling is not that hard on your body. So that makes a lot of sense that Joe would have you guys supplement your running training with cycling. Yeah. I remember you came over and used our Peloton on Swift one time. and <laughs> You did a hard ride. It was like three hours, pretty high power. I'm like, I can't believe she walked home. <laughs> like, I'd, be, I'd be destroyed. There's no way I could walk home. I'm well, still you, in awe. You changed. You, Spencer, I have to credit you with part of this paradigm shift because I, I had a really bad freak knee injury and subsequent surgery into your comeback in 2021, right before the Tokyo Olympics. And the first thing that I was able to do from my knee surgery was spin with no resistance. And that was the first thing that I could really do for training. And so before I could run, I was consistently riding three to four hours, like pretty hard. But I would get halfway through these rides and think like, there's no way. I, I don't even know how to spell my name anymore. Like, this is so hard and I can't, I'm not pushing Watts anymore. Like, what's going on? And I was telling this to Spencer and he asked what I was fueling with <laughs> I, forgot about <laughs> I was like <laughs> this. i had a couple of noon tabs he's like that's about 15 calories total so we're gonna need to reassess this and you i came over and was set up on your on your peloton you had the power pedals going you had like a snack table lined up for me with like shot blocks and different gels and whatever and i was flying and we've revisited the cross training my my training partner emma coburn had a, a really bad hamstring tear at the end of her year last year and she they started revisiting the cross training and same thing was she was having a hard time keeping her heart rate up. And I came back with a bowl of Haribo and she was like, Oh wow, I'm feeling good. So we've learned from cycling is, uh, running training is way more scientific. We're so dialed in. All of us are wearing heart rate monitors all the time. Some people are wearing stride pods. Our coach is routinely taking lactate on us. We've done lactate step tests. A lot of people have done VO2 tests. We're really dialed in with like our efforts and whatever. And then our, our all of our training goes into this huge platform called Runalyze. And our coach is consistently monitoring trends on all of us. And we're able to avoid a lot of injuries and illnesses for the most part and, and get really fit with more inv individualized training. but what we've learned from cycling is that fueling is important and running is so archaic in the way that we would go out and just bang out these, you know, 15 to 17 mile long runs at, you know, low six minute pace average on a sip of water. And you'd feel like the bottom of a trash can for about three days. after that. <laughs> <laughs> and now, you know, we're taking gels. And when I'm training on the bike, I'm drinking my what i call super gatorade which I, I just make extra strength gatorade so i'm making sure that i'm getting the 40 or 60 grams an hour that we've learned from the peloton but yeah the high carb revolution started 
in my basement two years ago. It's, did. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny you say that about cycling, about the scientific of the training, because Team Sky, great team, like had a lot of success through the years, won something like, I think they won like six out of eight Grand Tour, no, maybe seven out of eight Tour de France's in a row, perhaps. I'm not looking at the figures in front of me, but pretty good team, you'd say. Pumped a lot of money, like to the tune of 50 million US dollars a year into the team. And they were doing what you're just got, like they were starving themselves during rides. The thought, and this was not long ago, this was like 10, 10 to five years ago. They would just starve themselves on rides. It was just like, don't eat, drink as little as possible. I guess like high protein. Keto. Keto, yeah. They, and like, I think Chris Froome is still doing this. And this is one of the theories as to why he's so slow relative to the rest of the Peloton now. And it's like, just in the last few years, they realized like, hey, you should eat a bunch when you're trying to ride and burn a bunch of calories because your body's like a furnace and it needs to burn energy to then put out massive amounts of energy. And this like just started when I'm like, how did anyone miss this? How, how was this a thing that just happened recently? I mean, I did a race and I'm not, I would not say I'm in particularly good shape, especially relative to where I used to be like five and a half hours. This was last fall. And I found these, these, um, bottles like a drink mix and it was like 320 calories per bottle 90 grams of carbs so you can drink that easily in an hour you, you could take if you really wanted to you could be consuming like 750 calories per hour on on the bike which was really tough to do before that so it is like really simple just put a bunch of carbs in and you'll get out a bunch of power and i was able to push like five hours into this race pretty big numbers that I probably couldn't do when I was like training a lot and super fit because my body was just starved and didn't know that I didn't know that I had to feed it. But you also see these attacks coming from further and further out, like Rimco over the weekend mm -hmm. attacked, you know, like 50K. We, we didn't know because they like didn't have the ticker on the screen. So we just had to guess how far away it was. But he attacked 50K out pretty easy, pretty routine, just like soloed into the finish line. Like that would have been hour. inconceivable five years ago. I think Philippe Chalbert, it might have been 2018 Tour of Flanders, he attacked really far out, like 90K, 80K out, maybe less than that. And it blew people's mind. Like they didn't know that that was possible. But, you know, if you're fueling and you just kind of think about it like a math problem, it's like, well, if he can hold that power and he can consume enough carbs to push himself through that final hour of racing, it actually shouldn't be that hard for him. So I'm a little dubious when I see all these cycling. It's like, oh, we've got the cycling science down. I'm like, do you? Because you told me that five years ago yeah. and you didn't. Like, what are we going to know five years from now? Yeah, yeah. I do think to your earlier proposition that this has got to be a huge reason why we're seeing incredible performances. Like, this is groundbreaking, even though as, you, as you're saying, like, duh, right? Like, put <laughs> yeah. gas in Eat tank, with, yeah, that <laughs> go helps. fast, obviously. But I, I don't really know it, the... In running, it was more like a vibe, right? Like, we don't stop. We are so strong. We don't need anything. Um, and then when you think about it more, it, it does make a lot of sense. But um, I also think that the, the nutrition companies and their formulations, it's like it's easier to digest. Yeah. You're not going to need a nature break because they figured out a way to be able to get this high octane fuel in your body in a way that you can stomach it and manage it and just keep going. And it's also not just in the moment. I'm noticing it. I've got these uh, 40 gram gels. They're so awesome. It takes me about a mile to get them down because they're <laughs> kind of big. But then a mile later, I feel like I hit the stars in Mario Kart. I'm feeling awesome. And it's not just in the moment that I feel better. It's the next day I'm not waking up or I'm not sitting around drinking my morning coffee with the achy leg feeling that I would have in the past where I just had taken myself into, you know, the negative zone of my body is completely empty and feeding off its own muscles to I've got something in the, in the tank and my recovery is so much better. So imagine doing the 21 day stage race. Yeah, and yeah. you're not you're not killing yourself and taking yourself to the, the depths of hell that you might have in the past. Yeah. And I think, I mean, you proposed a question maybe last summer. You're like, why? Why? Yeah. How is everyone getting so fast? I just got off a call actually with some insiders in the sport who were saying that it's like Mark Cavendish right now is putting out higher power numbers at the Tour of Columbia than he was when he was at HTC 10 years ago. 
winning like four or five stages per Tour de France. So you ask yourself, like, how is this possible? And, you know, he maybe will win one stage of this tour, but he's not the sport's most dominant sprinter. But how is this man getting better every year? And, you know, George Hincapi said, everyone is getting better every year, but everyone's staying the same place in the peloton. So you just Mm -hmm. kind of ask yourself, like, how is this possible? Some of it probably could be attributed to people are just eating a correct amount and that they're not starving all the time and that will see your power numbers go up. I guess. And and maybe some other ones would be, you know, like really young riders are really good now. Like we just saw um, two of them on. It was actually nice to see Adam Yates, a man in his 30s, just dismantle the youngsters on the final day. Sorry, guys, I got it. (laughs) But really, these young riders are incredible. Like Isaac, or I guess it's like Isaac del Toro, the Mexican sensation. You know, I think he's just turned 20 years old and he's coming in and like he was the only rider over the weekend that could challenge Rimco at that race. And you're like, how is this possible? that all these young riders are just so good, you know, but maybe in the past their team directors would be like, well, like, you know, you've got to work for other people and that now you're seeing more freedom for these young riders and that's elevating the entire Peloton because if you have, let's say you have 20% of the riders that are young and talented and they would have been just like working for a team leader or not even allowed to attack or ride fast because it's like not how it's done or not even there because they're in the U23 ranks, which are I think not appropriate. Like if you're a really good 19, 20 year old, you should just go pro. It's With the a big dogs. Waste your time to go U23. And a lot of times you can regress because it's not easy living. You know, you're not making any money. Or maybe you're making some money, not a lot. Living in poor conditions. The races are hard. Maybe don't even, you can't even use your superior physicality because it's not super like tough courses. It's more of like skill based and like explosive explosion based which isn't good for someone like Jonas Vindigo for example who didn't do that great at those level races but you just put these guys in the big races they do good so maybe just having the most talented riders in the race is making the races faster a little simplistic but that's a that's a theory and then I kind of wonder I kind of think that riders are just better like yeah. th- maybe it's just an anomaly it's just statistical anomaly where you know, you don't want to drag on anyone from the mid 2010s, but we had like two or tour, tour, tours de France's where like Roman Bardet was second. And it's like Roman Bardet is probably just as good as he was back then. Yeah. And he's not even going to get he's anywhere not in, close to in second. The conversation. Yeah. yeah. Or maybe he was, there was a year where he was sec. he was on the podium and his teammate was on the podium who was like in his mid thirties and a professional mountain biker who just raced road on the side. And you're like, maybe that wasn't like the cream of the crop in terms yeah. of talent, you know, without, we're not on the move so we can say stuff like this. No one will hear it, but <laughs> not, not that we're on, we're on the main channel anymore. But, you know, I do kind of think that the level is just higher. If you look back at the last few tours and especially Voltas and Giros where you had Garrett Thomas and Primus Roglic duking it out at the Giro, you wouldn't have had that level of talent probably five, six years ago. Or, you know, where you have Tade and... Jonas at the tour like that's a little bit different than Vincenzo Nibali winning by seven and a half minutes in 2014 yeah yeah and I listened to the the pod with is this the correct pronunciation Richard Pluga 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 Pluga. he liked it yeah he he told us how to pronounce his name before that podcast (laughs) it kind of is Pluga Pluga but it's not we're not Dutch so we yeah (laughs) we really can't mimic it yeah whatever Uh, sorry Richard Pluga I listened to his podcast uh, with you, and I think that uh, Visma now, not Jumbo, Visma, uh, the idea of like talent acquisition and like actually looking for talented yeah. riders. When I was hearing that, I thought, "Are you absolutely joking me? Like this is a new idea. <laughs> this is this is supposed to be a groundbreaking idea. Like this is this is." NCAA recruitment for a track and field team. Like, of course, you're looking for talent in unexpected ways. And if I were if I were recruiting for a running team, I would look at states with really challenging weather conditions. Like, I would look at the state of Minnesota. And if you have a, a high school kid running fast in the spring in Minnesota, you think maybe what were they doing in the winter? Maybe they were Nordic skiing. Maybe they were on their basketball team. They're they're making rubbing two nickels together and yeah, getting yeah. a dime and you're looking at Colorado kids who have this big aerobic base, but maybe their times aren't that as fast as the California kids who have perfect weather year round. So these principles of like scouting, it seems like 
such an obvious proposition, but when Visma is the leader in cycling and talking about how like this is a major advantage to them, it it makes me think that this is just truly the first time we're seeing the best of the best coming out of different corners of the planet talent wise. Yeah, I thought yeah, yeah. I've been reflecting on that interview as well. And I thought that was the most interesting thing he said. Because people often criticize them of like, oh, they just have more money than everyone else, so they can pay to, but to they don't. go to training camps. Yeah, they don't. I mean, I guess their budget has gone up and they're probably one of the wealthier teams now, but they're not the wealthiest team. And I guess Christoph Laporte said he'd never been to an altitude camp that before blew he went to my the team. Mind. Yeah. I can't mid level college runners in the US have been to an altitude camp. Not people making millions of dollars or at least hundreds of thousands of euros every year in the pro peloton. It astounds me that someone at that high a level has not trained at altitude. I, 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 it's, it's unconscionable. Like I can't think, I, I, I don't understand how this happens. And it's not like he's not from like American Samoa. You know, it's not right. that different. Yeah, yeah. He lives in France. He could yeah. just easily get to high altitude. Yeah. I do think, well, we'll circle back on that. There's like a whole French cycling angle there where I think they're almost rejecting modern techniques. I don't know why. I don't know. I think there's a lot maybe broken with French cycling where they're like holding themselves back without realizing it. I mean, if you really want to dig into the the French team unchained episode, you oh, see a lot I of questionable it. decisions being yeah. made there. <laughs> yeah. But Pluga, as, a, as a Thibaut Pino <laughs> stan for life, yes. But Pluga saying that really the thing that they optimized was not they were able to do those training camps because they didn't waste money on pad riders and it might sound simple but it's like you know let's say caleb Ewan, i think made 1.5 million euros last year it's a huge lift for his lotto team and think of everything lotto couldn't do as they're paying that salary and nothing against caleb Ewan personally but he's just not delivering them the value they need for that amount of money they could have done a lot of things with that money and you see that with, the, I mean, that was like standard in cycling. You just like blow money on riders who never would, would never return that. And if you don't do that, crazy idea, you can spend that money on things that make the riders better, like yeah. altitude camps. It's a really simple idea that I guess wasn't adopted for a while. I mean, I interviewed with the team a few years ago and was going to like help them on these recruitment strategies. And they're basically like, what's your thesis? And I'm like, sign good riders, try to sign good riders. And I'm like, do you guys like, you know, how do you, what, what's your internal calculation for X rider produces Y results and gets paid Z, you know, because that's the matrix matrix you should use if someone wins two races a year and they're making 2 million euros a year, probably not a good value out of that rider. But if they're making 60,000 euros a year, that's really good value. And they were like, oh no, we don't even, can, we don't even know what people make. And I'm like, well, this is like, that's not great. And I didn't get the job. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but who, who knows what could have been, but yeah. it was actually with Alpes and Deconic. And then I watched that Unchained episode where they got, the guy run, runs the team is so intense. And I was like, maybe, maybe that was for the best. I don't know yeah. if that would have worked out that well, but it is kind of funny that it's like, oh, we just signed good riders and it, and it works out well. And I think maybe a component of that is and and guys used to get you know you didn't really have to produce results but if you're just like a known entity you could race into your mid to late 30s and make it de make decent money and never get any results and you just get re-signed 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 why i guess you're just a pleasant presence in the team i think that culture is going away where they're now managers are realizing like i could be signing cheap 20 year old 21 year olds who are going to produce results so maybe i won't keep signing veteran riders who don't produce. But there was a theory, I think it was Rain Terame put forth this theory that during the EPO era, there wasn't a lot of focus on it optimizing anything because it didn't really matter what you did. Yeah. If you just on tons of EPO, it's like really just go spin the legs, do some training and you're going to be fast. So teams, not only did riders get lazy, but like teams got lazy and they didn't really, it's just like, well, if the, if the cocktail's right, the team will do well. And then when EPO became harder and harder to use, like in massive amounts, and I'm not saying it's not being used anymore, but definitely not in the same way it used to be used, then it, I, I mean, maybe EPO is not being used. You see a lot of these positive tests are like shoulder drugs, if mm -hmm. you will, like kind of ways to maybe starve yourself and then keep your hormone production up by putting it in externally. But when that went away and it got harder to do in the mid 
2010s, this goes back to our Froom destroying everyone conversation. Just no one knew how to do anything. It was like house cats who are then living outside. And then now people are finally getting smarter about it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you don't have to, if you don't have to do the work, you don't have to do the work and you're not going to think about the work because it's not even part of your calculus of like, how do you do your job? You just boop, boop, boop. And you have your little cocktail and you are succeeding. And if, if that's never part of the thought process of how do I get better? If you've never had to think of how do I get better, you're just not going to think about it. You're not going to have you're not going to have strategies. You're not going to have training theory, let alone a bunch of processes in place to get you to where you need to go. You know, you're not going to have periodization of your training. It's just going to be like if you're taking shortcuts, you don't have to think about the long term. So it makes sense why there was such a lag. And now we're seeing things come back, come back around with, with talent, with proper training, proper nutrition. And I think, you know, cycling operates to my understanding, these great teams operate on a much higher budget than the track and field world. Um, but seeing it all t- all come together, like, well, no wonder they're doing so well. Like I look at uh, the tour and I'm thinking of like, all right, well, we're, I was up training in San Moritz before the last tour. Was this last summer or the summer before that when Wout Van Art was there? I think that was this summer. I think that was this yeah. summer, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're always on, there's always a Wout watch going there's always on. A, yeah. I, I have to put out a PSA, and it's really more of an apology to Wout Van Art. I did send him a DM a couple summers ago because I, I, I just want to apologize and say, I'm actually a very normal person. <laughs> I'm a really good athlete and normal person. I have friends. I don't <laughs> have a poster of you in my house or anything like that. Think you're just a cool athlete, cool rider, and I just wanted to see if you wanted to go for a run once in the forest in Leuven, where I where I base. And then I saw that you were in San Moritz when I was there, and just did, was I looking around for you on the roads? Maybe I was, but just to say good job. But I did I did unsend the DM, so I don't think you ever read it, or maybe if he did read you it, he get ignored that DM it. Out there um, again. But anyway, back to my original point, when we are on a training camp, when the parallels between professional distance running and, and cycling is we, we do similar buildups of like, you put in a huge base season, you see these riders in the fall, winter, just logging, you know, 20 plus hour weeks doing all this, you know, crazy base work. It's not, it's not intense. It's not a lot of impressive riding, just a ton of hours. We do the same thing, ton of mileage, lots of threshold work, whatever. And then you see them shift into a, a more of a race mode or a pre, pre-competition mode. And maybe you train at altitude. I live in Boulder, Colorado at, what are we, 5,700 feet or something like that? Here? Yeah, I just calibrated this morning. Yeah, let's what see what the Garmin my, says. It says 55. I mean, we are in North Boulder. It could be closer to 56. Yeah, I think, I think we're right around there. That's so, like 1,700 meters or something like that, if yeah. you don't use feet. If yeah, if we're doing meters, and then some some of the year I'm at three thousand meters in Crested Butte, and you use that altitude time to like really galvanize your training. You're turning the screw a little bit, getting ready, and then you go down to sea level and you crush it. The difference between professional runner altitude camp and world tour team is there is no chef, there is no dietitian with you, there is no team masseur there's for i mean for us we're a we're an independent team we all have our own separate shoe sponsors we're really self-powered in this if like i'm paying for my training camp i'm going to san moritz i'm getting my place on booking.com i'm walking to coop every day and we take good care of each other we're all we you know we have a cooking rotation and i cook one day emma cooks the next day Corey cooks the next day but i'm, I'm just thinking of like if you if i had the the budget for these things like how much better could my performance be if you're you know crossing off all of these things so all you need to do is just get your minutes in do your training and then just totally chill out for the the rest of the day and that's for me the beauty of training camp is like i i don't really need to walk my dog or yeah you deal with the minutia of owning a home or anything anything like that but I do think that the world tour teams are are doing an incredible job at preparing these athletes or at least like taking taking the 
load of living off so that they can just train. There are a few riders. Uh, I'm a big training camp person too. Like, give me a week in Tucson, and I'm, I'm and I might be in the tour. Yeah, I'm flying. <laughs> but I think like Alexander Kristoff never does them. He's just like at home because he has like a million kids, so he's at home all the time in Norway training. <laughs> like, he sh- he might be the best cyclist in the world yeah. <laughs> if he's doing as well as he's doing. But you actually see it pay off. Like, if it's really bad weather or a really oddball race, he tends to do better than other people, and I do kind of attribute that to training in norway all the time and just probably like diff diff not difficult conditions but just like yeah it's like oh my god the kids are making noise and going it's just like your life is kind of constant chaos but it does instill a bit of like hard mentality in your mind you can handle anything and then i guess mads Pedersen. i heard that he's never done a train an altitude training camp before he just started this year he's really good go figure yeah where it is yeah i don't it's, but so I understand it with running more. It's definitely a slam dunk. Like go up to altitude, train, drop down, race. Like that's a s- easy calculation. Sometimes I wonder with with cycling where like you'll see Remco go up to altitude. He'll come down if he does a one off event. He's absolutely flying, or he's flying first day of the Volta. But you know you're at the sea. You're all at the same altitude together for three weeks during a Grand Tour. You do kind of wonder like do the benefits wear off by week three or is your body adapted it's just existing at altitude good for your body and you get better and better and better and maybe that's still helping you in week three if i was a physiologist on a world tour team and i uh would be thinking about this problem i would be looking at um hemoglobin hematocrit ferritin levels um maybe i would test this of like an earlier season uh, racing situation where you come down from altitude, you feel great, probably because all of your levels are um, are elevated. You're feeling really good. Your um, your br- your breath rate and your perceived effort is is lower. There are some weird things that can happen. Like if you're not used to going up and down, like a lot of athletes say, on day five they feel really weird at sea level coming from altitude like day five, day 10, you know, you're just like encountering these physiological challenges and changes to your body. But I would be testing this and I would be taking little blood panels throughout, throughout their time coming back to sea level to just get a gauge on like what's actually happening. And do you need to, in fact, go to altitude for six weeks? Like, is that more beneficial for you? Can you hold your altitude blood levels longer if you're, if you're at altitude for longer? instead of like a three-week training camp like just trying to optimize for how how can your body feel best perform best and how can you use these training tools to your advantage so that you can hold your peak form for long interesting i guess cycling uh, yeah i was just thinking about as you're saying that i mean that's a good idea i guess cycling is complicated even more than running because like you can go to crescent butte in the winter time and run probably couldn't ride like they're quite no. restricted i'm just trying to think of places with altitude in europe like a ski resort obviously you'd not be able to ride i'm i am surprised that it's not a trend of people like going to ski resorts in the winter time and just training indoors yeah i would not be shocked if that's yeah. like a trend in five years yeah you can go to the canary islands the only i guess bottleneck there is like there's one hotel really high up and that's where like everybody stays people tend to like lose their minds up there because it's you're just like in a high desert nothing going on and it does kind of feel like if you get the more you can stomach being up there the easier it is like being up in crested butte is probably even though it's It's cold it's it's probably similar though i i got six weeks up there and by the end you know i didn't grow up there crested butte is a lovely town i love it have a condo there no knock on crested butte but to get to a Target, you have to drive two and a half hours to Montrose. <laughs> and so just like your creature comforts yeah. of, you know, DoorDash, like these things that we've grown accustomed to in the modern era, which I should just, you know, get over it. But y- you encounter loneliness and lo- loneliness is also a killer of like, yeah. if you're, if the vibe is off, it doesn't matter, right? Like this can be the best thing for your body, but if your mind isn't there or it's starting to feel like sacrifice instead of choice, then like that's going to be inhibiting of your performance also. So 
I would think it would be awesome. Like you go up to a ski resort with your buddies, you're on the rollers, you're getting fit. Nobody else is doing this. That's that's also like another a, a good mental piece to it is like when we're up in Crested Butte, I'm thinking like there's nobody in the world that's training at higher altitude than we are in the Rift Valley, like or like in up up in Kenya. You know, we're at the same altitude. We're at the we're the same altitude as as the Ethiopians. Like we're, there's nobody in the world that's doing things that we're you know we're not doing other than if people are doing gray area stuff or God forbid doping, we're not doing that. But we're doing we're doing the best possible thing for a body that a clean athlete can can be doing. And I think it'd be kind of fun. I think somebody should try it out, like go up and surely some of these guys have some ski condos somewhere. They could just hunker down, crank out some fire playlists, start watching some Netflix series and just like yeah, I would, do it. That's essentially what you guys are doing it. a yeah. lot of times in Crested Butte. You're just running indoors. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it just gets really cold there and very, very snowy. There's times where, you know, it's, there's five feet of snow on the ground. so. Yeah, you're on you're on a treadmill a lot. I guess that's I guess now that I think about it, that's kind of the whole point of Boulder that it became popular with endurance athletes because it's high, not a ski resort. You know, it's like I can see snow outside, but it's very sunny. Yeah. So you can recreate if you have to. And I guess it's less popular with cyclists than it used to be. It used to be really popular with pro cyclists like Why 80s, do you think that 80s. is? I think it's because I think a few things. I think racing in the U.S. is essentially dead. So yeah. people used to base themselves here and race in the U.S. Also, some people used to base themselves here and race in Europe. But the idea of basing yourself in the U.S. and racing in Europe is pretty much dead now. Like nobody does that anymore because just because of travel time. In general? Yeah, I guess travel time. Maybe some of the like I talked to Larry Warbus, who's an American, but he lives full time in Nice, and he was saying he just comes back once a year because the days it's hard on your body and the days he misses training just aren't worth it to go back and forth it's yeah. like more advantageous to stay there live there race there so if you race in europe you pretty much are in europe all the time like riley riley sheehan just moved to girona he's a boulder local and i guess he'll come back probably for like a month in the off season maybe and stay with his family but you know he's not going to live here like people used to and that probably makes sense if you are racing so much in europe yeah. but if you're a triathlete or runner you're kind of just parachuting into events. So mm -hmm. I almost feel like since I've lived here, Boulder's gotten more and more popular with triathletes. It's yeah. almost like triathlete central now. Yeah, it, no, it really is. It really is. One of my really, really good friends is Holly Lawrence, who is a 70.3 world champion. And she and her husband, Sean, who was one of the first pair of twins to break four in the mile NCAA champion back in Indiana back in the day, sort of athletic power couple they had been living and training in la which is kind of an unconventional place for triathletes and sh they just moved here this year and this past year and have thought like why did we wait so long to come here this is truly triathlete mecca um and you've got olympic champion Flor duffy multi rinny down the street like there are some of the best triathletes of all time live in bold live and train in boulder and it, it just makes total sense you've got outdoor pools the running here is is the best running in the world and this is an altitude that's sustainable a lot of runners wouldn't actually come to boulder for an altitude training camp because they don't think it's high enough people are more attracted to like a flagstaff elevation so more around that seven thousand feet yeah but that's not the like Europeans would come would come to Boulder for for this altitude. But this is a sustainable altitude in that you can actually come close to hitting real race pace efforts. Whereas if you're if you're higher up, you're you're training slower. And I would assume that that's that would be the same on a bike too. It's like it's just yeah. it's too high to be able to sustainably train hard. Yeah, I'm probably I'm maybe in the minority here, but I feel like I almost atrophy. Like if I'm in Aspen, I'm just not pushing no. the power numbers I would push here. And it's like, if I'm up there for a month, I'm just getting like, not, I am getting weaker and weaker, maybe not slower and slower, but if I go back down to sea level, it would be a shock to my body. Yeah, I just the, have the muscle. Yeah, 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 totally. So yeah, it, it, I, yeah the fly, I wonder about the Flagstaff thing. And I was, you know, having meals with, some people in London recently who were like, so what's the deal with Boulder versus Durango? 
And it's like, well, Boulder's basically a suburb of Denver. You know, like we're not very far we're from Denver. Far. So, you know, so a lot of people don't like that. Like if you're real Colorado bro, you're out of here, you're moving to Telluride, you're in Durango. They don't want to be on the credit front range. But I kind of like that because of the creature comforts. Like if you're in Flagstaff, you're in Flagstaff. And like yeah. they do have an airport, but it's expensive. Yeah. You're really far from Phoenix. Like I would struggle with that isolation, I think. Completely. And it's also most of my races are not in the US either. And if you're traveling internationally, like I've made three or four international trips last year, and I can just take the bus out to Denver and yeah. fly direct to London, Frankfurt, Munich, Tokyo, wherever I need to, to race. So it just makes life less stressful, less less friction if you can do your job and not feel like you're on a huge schlep why is it not it's like not a thing at all for runners for american runners to live in europe full-time is that just not because a thing. there's just not the volume of events to make that worth it like you could just a travel very there. good question actually that is a very good question american athletes like team usa americans are they receive, I think there's a, there's a couple of reasons. One, they receive a lot of support from the USOPC. If you have an injury or if you have anything, you can go to a training center and, and get cared for. American-based athletes tend to make more money on average than all other countries. USA Track and Field puts a lot of time and money into growing the sport and it's also the hardest olympic team to make so i think that the focus is having like there's just so much depth here that like being in the place where you know making your team is what most people center their year around is more valuable to them to be based here than to to do diamond leagues yeah yeah i guess not you because your most important race is your olympic trials yeah if you're not qualifying for the olympics it's going to be tough so that's the race you should i guess also tracks are the same tracks a are track the same. in yeah. europe is the same as a track here yeah, yeah. so like part and of the pro- yeah. most of the best most of the best coaches are based in the u.s which is it is really interesting it's like our our most lucrative racing season is summer in europe but everyone's here it's fun yeah i a lot of this is just I feel like it's it's bigger than my brain. Like it feels like coaching is such an industry in running. Like you have yeah. these like superstar coaches. Yeah. And in cycling, it's almost like, should a lot of these guys just be coaching cycling? Like, is Inigo San Milan it's the Inigo smartest San person Milan. in the world? Like, he is. Yeah. You know, Michele Ferrari, controversial figure. I, I think he's a pretty good coach at the base of it. And like that's a huge advantage to have in cycling. We were talking before we recorded about cycling training. I kind of wonder a theory I have is you it's really just training zone to at extreme extremely high volumes some intervals and I almost feel like the coaches are managing rest like that's the big difference there may be our riders who are just showing up and you're not they're not fit enough they didn't do the work but I don't think that's very common anymore I almost think the reason people aren't good is they're overtrained or they cut too much weight. They got too skinny. Like, those are the two things the coaches manage. Like San Milan is telling them when to rest and when to eat. And like everyone's doing the work. And like that's the secret sauce, I, I think. There is no shortcut for the hours needed. Like that's something I've I've learned coming from a terrible uh, knee injury is that you cannot fake it. You really cannot fake it. I it took me you know, almost two years to come back to the form needed to be competing with the best in the world. That is a huge component for sure. Like, I think you're right on the money with like the amount of zone two needed. I do think that they could be doing better. Obviously, rest is huge, right? Like I just said, I'm training 13 ish hours a week. That doesn't account for like gym sessions and body work and sports psychology, whatever. But so let's say, Let's say if you put everything that I'm doing together, I may be looking at like 20 hours a week. That's not a full-time job, but the rest of my time is truly spent like recovering. And it's not, it's, we have wearables now. You can see when you're, when you're recovering and when you're not, you know, I've got an aura ring that shows me my heart rate and my HRV every night and 
all these things that's like in the past, I think underutilized the importance of like true, like non sleep deep relaxation and all of these abilities to like go parasympathetic, sympathetic, parasympathetic, sympathetic, and all of these processes in our bodies that are really important. So, yeah, managing rest is huge. I just think that Inigo is probably the only one who's like truly coaching. And this is just coming from my like deep depths of Twitter, (laughs) Twitter reconnaissance, but athletics in any, it doesn't matter what sport it is. It's a, it is science. So the fact that people are just vibing it out there, they're just riding. They're like, I'm just going to get my hours in and I'm not going to really worry about the efforts. Like, I think that that is criminal. Like, how are we not, how are we not coaching this? How are we not like, you're also not all the same people, right? Like you all have different engines under the hood. Like where is the specialization? Where is when you when you have someone like Jonas who has an insane VO2 max, like one of the higher highest recorded ever VO2 maxes in the world. It's like, yeah, well, he's probably not going to need to do very many VO2 max sessions. He's not going to need to do as many, many intervals, but maybe he needs to work on his power. Maybe he needs to work on his torque. Maybe he needs to work on something different than somebody who doesn't have as high of a VO2 max. And that's where it blows my mind that there is not like programming seemingly for cycling, that it's just like you're just out there and you're stopping for a coffee and you're what I mean, what? I think what's happened in the last even half decade in cycling, and it used to be X riders would be considered good coaches. And you'd even see this at the amateur levels like, the guy was the local pro. He should be training us. He knows what he's doing. And I noticed this like, you know, five, six years ago locally, like really good riders would be like, yeah, some cat four from Colorado Springs is coaching me. And I'm like, oh, that's a little funny. Like, you know, your instinct is like, well, what does he know about racing? But it's actually not the same talent coaching someone and being a good rider. And it started to trickle up almost to the world tour where now I'm assuming EF does this now. They have like scientists train the riders. And I know for a fact that's what Visma does. It's just, I was talking to a team manager who was like, doctors should be training these people. Like this should just not be like, I know how to train because I've done it myself and I'm going to tell someone what to do. Or it's like actual professional scientists are training these people. And that's probably why we're seeing, also why we're seeing the level go up. Yeah. Oh, completely. And I, I think, I think you need a little bit of both. I mean, scientists, don't necessarily have they they haven't felt firsthand what it takes to send your body into absolute oblivion for a result like you can see it on paper but to have like the living breathing feel of it all is it is a different ball game so i think you need both i think you can't expect to do superhuman feats without thought behind it and without i mean yeah, direction and guidance from somebody who knows like what what is the the goal behind what you're doing. And that's where in running, you know, there's so many different training methodologies and and you can you can pick up a book and you can read about whatever and you don't necessarily need to be a sp- a physiologist, but when you're getting to the very top level and you're and now access to all this information is so much easier where most coaches in Boulder have a lactate meter and are reading like what's happening physiologically to their athletes. It's like you, you're missing out if you're not, if you're not at least having someone with a, with an eye on your training that knows what's going on. But then, yeah, then you need both. Maybe, maybe you have, you have that physiologist, but then you have like the, the coach who's there for the mentals of it all of like, this is, you guys are going into battle and today we will win. Yeah. And I guess that's what you've seen. Like when you watch Unchained, we do not have a partnership with Unchained. I've mentioned this show like 50 times, but the, the guy screaming at them, like, come on, Jonas, he is not, Gershon Neiman is not coaching them. Yeah. Like coaching their training. He's like their race coach. Which I love. Yeah. And you have seen this like division of labor, which I think is helpful. And I think the reason for that originally was you used to just like go have your, you would have your own coach and you would race for whatever team you're on. 
I think what happened is people would like be naughty. They would go to like naughty coaches and then the teams <laughs> wanted to control what yeah. the riders were doing. Yeah, so they brought it all in house yeah. thinking that it's safer that way. And it probably yeah. is. Yeah. Come on, you guys. He's like popped up like a, a friend of mine as a YouTube channel and he's like got picked up by the, at the train station by him. I'm like, oh, this is like the biggest celebrity in the world oh picked you up at the train station. Unbelievable. Man, if only I could meet Gersha. Yeah. But one thing I wanted to ask you about, we were debating this, like all these professional cyclists are like skipping the, I guess not all of them, but like Wout Van Aert skipping the tour, Matthew Vanderpool maybe skipping the tour to focus on the Olympic road race. As an Olympian, I thought you would be a good person to take, take the temperature on this. I understand like track and field Olympics, very important. Cycling, people often say like, I swear, every time I watch the Olympics, with people are like, huh, didn't know road racing was in the Olympics. And it's, it, I feel like it's almost like included, like that they put it in the corner. It's like the first day they pat it on its head and like, oh, road cycling, you're so cute. And it's just, I cannot believe people are, these big riders are focusing on the Olympics so much. It drives me insane to a point where, because it, it's so, ran, it's kind of a random race. It's done with your national team, which, which is really fun as a viewer. Like I love the national team races because everything, no one really works together. Like, okay, I'm not, I'm not on, I'm Wout and Jonas. You're not, yeah, Wout's not going to be working for Remco. Yeah, like we don't <laughs> work together. We yeah. just happen to be on the same national team. I get paid by Visma. They're still signing my checks at the end of the day. And I'm going to be competing against this guy at the Vuelta next week. So it's like tenuous. It's actually a great, it's like perfect because it's like tenuous alliances small teams the teams don't work very well together they're secret teammates stacked throughout the race but then the courses i mean it is cool because it's just even if the course isn't hard like they did it in london and everyone thought it was going to be a sprint finish and if you race 250 kilometers really hard it is selective because that's how people race but it often produces like a somewhat random winner i so i'm surprised people focus so much on it like do you think this is cool and let now like cycling is becoming an olympic sport i, I kind of don't like the hot take don't really like the olympics i feel like the less thomas bach has to do with your sport the better your sport is i mean i guess the nba now you know is kind of embracing the olympics more and that's cool but i'm always wary of like the olympic alliance like i feel like that's gonna work out well for the ioc and maybe not for the actual sport but what's your take on this are you excited that it's like featured at the olympics now Hot take, I disagree with everything you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> also, hold in hold my theory. Everything, not everything. <laughs> I'm like, they should do the tour. ASO only looks out for the riders. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, I think it's really cool, actually. I think that there's a couple of pieces to this puzzle that make this specific Olympics unique. It being in Paris, it being in Europe, where all of these riders live. The Olympics is... It's just cool. Everybody in the world who knows anything, who's had a thought about sport, knows the Olympics. And I think with more of a, I don't want to say like a globalization because it's, it's always been global, but all sports having their Netflix show and social media becoming a bigger part of the sporting world and personality being allowed, I think the Olympics is almost getting more prestige and popularity in a sense of like, I don't ascribe to this, but if you're an Olympian, you get letters at the end of your name. So I would be Aisha Pratlier, O-L-Y. And like, you don't get letters to <laughs> add it to your name for being a Tour de France writer, which I, I you probably should. Like, that's that's insane. Nobody Nobody does that in the world. But what I think is happening is there is riders want to do it like it is it is a very very unique proposition that the s slimmest of margin of human being gets the honor of being an olympian and no one can take that away from you and an olympic medal is and this is coming from like you know i'm a i'm doing olympic sport but it is the greatest honor in all of sport and i think it's cool to see riders who like yeah, they they make a lot more money than track athletes and they have a really high profile but wanting to do wanting to do the Paris Olympics in particular makes a lot of sense to me. And I love it. 
I, you, you are onto something with Paris that that must be a major component yeah because it's it's like a monument has then just been organically created in the heart of Europe it's close for them and I guess we're not talking about people that could win the tour like Wout Van Aert's not going to win the Tour right. de France this year Matthew Vanderpool's not going to win it right being an Olympic gold medalist in those countries in Belgium and the Netherlands Lights probably a big out. deal huge deal like it's really interesting. A lot of smaller European countries, if you have an Olympic medal, like you're ostensibly set for life. Yeah. Well, I, yeah, I was in, I was in London, just like browsing, browsing the, the channels and they have, it's just like random, like Sam Quek. She was on the Olympics. She was captain of the Olympic gold medal winning field hockey team. And she's like a TV personality right. now, like yeah. to a level, like she's like Ryan Seacrest. Yeah. Of, of Britain and like Jennifer Valenti, American, won an, won an individual gold medal in the Olympics. I had to look this up actually just right now in Tokyo. And like, I doubt anyone in Boulder even knows who she is. She showed up to uh, Boulder Roubaix, which is like a local gravel race that's really hard. And she raced it on a road bike and won the last time they had it. It's like, yeah, she's an Olympic gold medal. She's pretty good. Yeah. But there is just like a dilution in the US, especially in cycling, where you're not going to be as famous. So maybe that's hard for me to grasp. Mm -hmm. I guess it's cool. I, I mean, maybe this is just an anomaly because Wout and Vanderpool are such big stars that they can just call it. It's like, yeah, I want to win the Olympics, yeah. and that's what I want to put my focus into. I do think it's absurd. That, like, I think Vanderpool and Pickock are going to do the mountain bike race and road race. Which road Sagan, race. So I think Peter Sagan was the first person to do this at Rio, and it was. You know, it would kind of be like if Roger Federer was like, "Well, I'm going to do tennis." and table tennis like yeah. they are the oh, same but they're not they're really not the same. same at all yeah 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 i also wonder if red bull has something to do with this or just like the idea of non-endemic cycling sponsors coming to the table of like just more influence at the olympics is really cool you know you'd like think of i think about a, a bunch of different olympians that are sponsored by red bull you think of mondo duplantis the pole vaulter the swedish pole vaulter who is just like Red Bull guy, Carson Warholm, the Norwegian 400 meter hurdler. It's like Red Bull's very invested in Can the Olympics they also. Where Red Bull stuff, no, they can't. No, no. But I guess Red Bull figures, if they're, they're so, a media if they're so good, it doesn't really matter. Like if they're wearing our stuff the rest of the time, yeah. no one is really thinking, what's his name? Carson Warholm. <laughs> Isn't there like beef with him and like an American hurdler? He like, there's not beef. There's an incredible ri rivalry between Rye Benjamin and Carson Warholm. Does he wear shoes? Is there something with the shoes? There's always something with the shoes. Yeah. But Puma has a very, very fast, very, very fast 400 meter hurdle spike. But his competitor, the competitor brand also has a very fast spike. So it's kind of apples to apples at this point. But yeah, Carson is, he's been unbeatable. I'm waiting for Nor Norway is not now invading pro cycling with uno x like really good team yeah. small country like four million people track Incredible and field are they going to be like max. the best nba players soon like what's going on here guys i know why are the norwegians dominating everything yeah. yeah i i you look at there's a very famous running family the ingebrigtsens they've had three sons be olympians in the 1500 and the 5k one of them has multiple olympic medals um world championships and they all started skiing at a really young age. Um, I do think that there is incredible endurance talent in Norway that's like probably nature and nurture at the same time of like incredibly high natural VO2 maxes. And they've been training it since they were little kids. Yeah. Yeah. It's probably something like, you know, if you, if you can like trace your ancestry to the Samoan islands, then you're like, 7,000% more likely to play in the NFL yeah. where there's just like nature and nurture. Yeah. But yeah, you could be real big, strong, fast guy. But if you didn't grow up in a place that just like was all about football, yeah. you're probably not going to be that good. Right. So yeah, I, I, I am fascinated by, because you'd think Swedes would be share that, but they don't produce at aerobic levels at quite the same way as Norwegians. But then Maybe they're all because like a lot of NHL players are Swedish, not a ton are Norwegian. So maybe they're all wasting their time making millions playing in the NHL, a <laughs> yeah. bunch of idiots. Or are like for, I think about this all the time, like the Jamaican sprinters. One of my good friends on Team Jamaica is Hansel Parchment, who's 
Olympic champion in the 100 meter hurdles, 110 high hurdles. He's got many other medals, but this guy's got to be like, I don't know, 6'6", six, six, at least. Absolute specimen of an athlete. Like, why isn't he playing in the NBA? Yeah. 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 I mean, I guess that would maybe be... Six, maybe 6'8". Six, I, don't, I don't know. I'd have to look it up. But just like extreme athleticism, like your reaction time, your flexibility, your speed, your power your strength weight ratio to be 110 high hurdler is off the charts. Like he probably could play any professional sport that he wanted to, but he's Jamaican. So he's a Olympic medalist hurdler. I guess that's what happened to Tim Duncan. He was from either the Virgin Islands or the Bahamas and there's pools. All, he was like a swimmer. So he was just going to be a really tall swimmer and then the pools got destroyed. And so he had to do something else. So he became like maybe the third best basketball player of all time. Crazy. But yeah, it does show you there's a lot of, probably a lot of latent talent out there that's not getting funneled into high paying sports and we just don't know about it. I mean, imagine, I guess Steven, like Steven Adams, like there's a reality where he just like never plays basketball. And <laughs> I feel like we don't talk enough about the Adams family. Oh my gosh. Yeah. There was a picture of you and his sister, Valerie Adams. Yeah. Good friends with Val. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was like shocked by the photo. It's yeah. Like, oh yeah. Big people. Yeah. I'm like a mini person compared to Val. It's wild. Yeah. And she's not even, she's probably like small in her family. She's one of the small Adams siblings. It's like the, you know, the Lopez twins, the, no. the two NBA oh, players. Yeah. It's like, we yeah. just don't, t like, they're like, yeah, they're pretty good. It's like, these guys are seven feet tall and like so athletic. And you're like, if they play baseball, it's all we would talk about yeah. is like yeah. how big a specimens the Lopez brothers are. And it's like, yeah, they're okay. Circling back to the Olympics. This is the beauty, one of the beauties of the Olympics is like, you're walking around the Olympic village and it's just a freak show of like every athlete that you have ever seen and they're all so different. I remember I was stretching in the village in Rio and to my left was like the Belgium gymnastics team. And they're, you know, I'm five, four, I'm towering over these women. They're doing the craziest stretching I've ever seen in, in my life. I could never do this. I looked to my right. Pau Gasol is in a full lunge doing some sort of like cable row he's still taller than me in a full lunge and you're just looking around at all of these the insane diverse incredible he, like freaks of the human species and it's pretty cool that, okay all right i'm coming around to yeah. it i'm in the elevator with rudy gobert sizing him sizing him up in Paris or in tokyo thinking like oh this is pretty cool i, I saw his his name tag because my i'm coming up to about his name tag height like mid mid belly and i text my coach like hey is rudy gobert good at basketball i'm in the <laughs> elevator <with him." laughs> but, you yeah, it's, fun. it's very polarizing cool. figure yeah yeah i'm gonna be like a 90 minute train ride away from the olympic road race this summer and i'm like i don't know if i'm gonna go Come <laughs> on. Sort of you're going you're going <laughs> the hassle the traffic no but no you're going. are you gonna be there early enough for the olympic road race or are you gonna come in later i don't know well i'm knocking on spencer's Excuse me, I burped. I'm knocking on Spencer's wood table. I'm shooting my shot, calling my shot that I'm making this Olympic team. And we have been discussing how, we'll, how we would train going into this thing. I'm sure we'll do some altitude maybe in San Moritz, but it's probably going to be pretty hot. So we'll probably need to do some heat acclimation. And I don't know where we would do that. So it would be, it would be cool to be nearby. Yeah, yeah. That actually, you brought that up. I forgot to bring that up during earlier in the episode. But that's also part of the calculation of doing like too much altitude training before, let's say, the Tour de France. So you're like you're up in San Moritz. It's got to be the coldest. It's so cold <laughs> it's so during cold. the summer. It's yeah, ridiculous. It's like, it makes me angry. Sometimes. Fifty-five. It's the hottest day we've had this year. So you're up there, and then you drop down, and you're in like baking hot Provence or something. And like, does that outweigh? Should you have been heat training and I'm like still, I still think we have a long way to go on like heat training. Like how yeah. beneficial is that? It is. Should you be doing it? It's very beneficial. And we've started doing it. But there's, again, technology is really cool. Like I've got a sauna blanket where I five days a week go in this little very, very hot sleeping bag for 40 minutes. And you, there are all these studies that show like so, how much sauna exposure that you need to pump up your blood plasma and all whatever your heat shock proteins and all this stuff. I'm not a scientist, but I do know that there are studies that show you exactly how to do it. 
and you can be heat acclimated and altitude trained at the same time. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, and that definitely works. I've, we've debated many times in this podcast if there's like the science is maybe not conclusive on if altitude tents actually help you or not. But obviously, just being hot somewhere will help you. Yeah. It doesn't matter if you're artificially doing it or not. Yeah. And is it throwing you off the short spread between the Olympics? I, I'm not an Olympian. I feel like I'm very thrown off by it. I feel I'm like we very, just had the Olympics. I feel like we just had the Olympics. I really do feel like we just had the Olympics. And it's crazy because there's so much hype in an Olympic year. It really is like no other year. And I feel like we just did this of like, here we go, Olympic year. We got to <laughs> do it all. And sponsors and blah, blah, blah. So yeah, there is a... I didn't do indoor track this year and a lot of people on my team didn't do indoor track this year. And I, I personally feel a little bit of like, yeah, gird your loins because this year is going to be big. And yeah. we did just do this in a very weird way in Tokyo. I'm going to also say, I know I said I was a normal person earlier, but I did see Rigoberto Uran in the Olympic Village dining hall in Tokyo. And I would like, if I saw Lady Gaga, I would be totally normal. I'm like, oh, hi, <laughs> Lady Gaga. But I see like professional cyclists and I freak out. I, I turn into a version of myself that is so uncool. And I was with my training partners, all of whom are like completely gorgeous. They all look like models. And we're, you know, eating our gyoza in the Tokyo Olympic <laughs> Village. And I see Rigo sitting by himself two tables away. I can see him through all of the plexiglass dividers. And I, I was too nervous to say hi. And I was <laughs> telling the girls, I'm like, do you know who this is? And they all think I'm crazy because I like cycling so much. And they're like, I ain't sh like, you guys are the same size. Like, why are you intimidated? Just like, go <laughs> over there and say hi, you freak. And I couldn't do it. That's like the meme. Where it's like it's someone in a corner at a party. And it's, but he's sitting over there like, they don't know I have 2.5 million Instagram followers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like he's like the most, he has the most followers on social media than any other cyclist ever. It's which insane. is, yeah, crazy. I mean, he must be a rock star in Columbia. <laughs> That's well, really... did you see what was happening this fall where he brought Wout? Yeah, I and forgot about that. What was it, Tour de Rigo? I was so obsessed with this. Like, why wasn't I in Columbia for this? It was like, yeah, his personal grand fondo and he like made Wout do it transatlantic flight to go to it but did he pay him large sums of money they're like on these backwaters wouts in like the very european jean shorts just so out of he's so out of his own context just sweating <laughs> and rigo is just living his best life they're making him like samba bachata I don't, I don't know what dance they were trying to make him do i was obsessed with this content i couldn't i couldn't stop well we'll get you i we have taken a ton of your time but before you leave i do want to like as I approach pro cyclist retirement age, I never used to think about, I used to just think like, well, you, okay, you're Garrett Thomas, you retire and then, and then you're good. But it's actually more complicated than that because I mean, maybe you haven't made enough money to do nothing. Even if you have, that's, you know, you can't really just sit around and do nothing for the rest of your life. I feel like the trend in cycling is, you know, like I'm just Mitch Docker, use him as an example, like good rider, very good personality like affable guy started a podcast before he retired from cycling just seamlessly transitioned from pro cyclist to podcast host and now he's just kind of like professional media personality still has he can still ride a ton so he just crazy rides roll ride from like melbourne to adelaide for the start of the tour down under and he has connections in the peloton that or garrett thomas i guarantee just the same yeah. thing he's gonna retire and he's gonna go you also like don't realize you think if you're a kid and you're like, you're going to make 5 million euros a year and pay no taxes, you're going to be set for the rest of your life. But like Karen Thomas probably has to make money because you have to live like 45 more years and you have expenses, taxes, they don't tell you about that property taxes, <laughs> but yeah, children, <laughs> tuition. So he'll probably just be a professional podcaster and very successful. Like, is that what, what's the norm in running? And then if you you know, if you don't want to share, you don't have to, but like, what are your personal plans once you stop running? Yeah. It's really interesting. Especially it struck me when you said, well, you're not going to do nothing. Yeah. These are people, myself included, I've been a hamster running my butt off on a wheel professionally for the last 12 years. You can't just like sit me in a room with nothing to do after this. I would go crazy. And most professional athletes would go absolutely crazy. Like you're 
These are incredibly driven, goal oriented, obsessive personalities that like, what, like, what would I even do if I wasn't doing anything? Like, I, I, I can't conceptualize like taking off the running shoes and being like, well, I guess I'll just do nothing. I, that being said, I have not made enough money in my career to retire from all life. But in running the norm is there's, there's not a huge norm. A lot of people become coaches. As we talked about, yeah. running coaching is, is big business. A lot of NCAA coaches, a lot of professional coaches, youth coaches. I'm not interested in that. I'm pretty intense. I once received a yellow card or a red card at a track meet. I didn't know you could do something, <laughs> but I wasn't racing at my team's conference my senior year and was yelling so vigorously at one of my teammates that I ever received a color card to like back off. Like I, I think I would get fired from a coaching job in the first week because I, I'm too hype. Um, <laughs> it's like the state has to come in and like yeah. suspend you as a state employee. We can't yeah. endorse this behavior. Exactly, like, ma'am, stand down. But yeah, it it is interesting. A lot of people move into like the running industry is big. I I was I assume this happens in cycling too. Like you go work for Specialized or Cannondale yeah. or something like that. That happens a lot of running and running. A lot of people, my husband included retire from running and then work for their the sponsor or like the, their previous sponsor. I'm I'm at an interesting place where I, I'm not sure what I want to do. I do a lot of work in athlete advocacy and sports governance with our global governing body, World Athletics. I've really enjoyed that and gotten to work on several different projects like human rights and making the sport bigger, safer place, more money, more fans, you know, what have you signing off on rule changes and, and innovation in sport. I find that stuff very interesting, um, but there aren't a ton of jobs uh, flowing out of that either. Um, I, the, the short answer is I, I don't know, but maybe it's my ego that thinks that I'm going to be fine. You know, I'm, I'm like reasonably of reasonable intelligence and you know, contrary to what I've said about my cycling fandom, like a, a pretty normal, likable person. So I feel like there's something I can do in the world, but things I'm exploring would be, yeah, like sort of high level business of sport, potentially some human rights work, or I might just want to totally transition out and just be in some sort of like incredible rat race, bad for your health inducing line of work. Because that's <laughs> essentially what I'm doing right now that just like involves nine hours of sleep. But yeah, not sure. It is. It, it's hard when athletes retire. I watched my husband retire in 2021. But because your whole life and your whole as much as as you want to say like, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm more than just a runner. Like you really have to be a runner. 24 seven if you're if you want to be successful on the world stage and as a cyclist you have to be a cyclist 24 seven and you know you're taking maybe two weeks off per year of training and it it becomes it consumes you it becomes everything and to set that down and find a new way to define yourself and find new goals to chase and new things to live for honestly like I, I freaking live for this stuff like I I love the thrill of lining up in a stadium of 40,000 plus people in my underwear to absolutely thrash myself and thrash other people in competition. Like it's it what we do is crazy and and you're riding in a peloton at 60 kilometers an hour with I I, I was really struck by how loud the peloton was in Unchained. Again, not a not an official sponsor here, but uh, <laughs> oh, oh wait, wait, the check is here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm now a pundit on Unchained. But and no, it's like it, the incredible risk and the incredible reward of of athletics is it's a drug, man. It's like it's it's going to be hard to set it down. And I'm sure for cyclists, it's it's the same thing. But you you use the people around you and you you talk it out and, you know, get a great therapist and ride it out into the sunset <laughs> and figure out something else to do. I feel like Kip t maybe Kip Taylor's like screaming at his radio saying we're wrong on this. But I, I have a theory that it's like, you know, the rat race job, bad for your health. I feel like it's oftentimes not as hard as people make it out to be. Like it's, it's hard to get those jobs. Yeah. But a lot of like big corporate jobs, it almost feels like they, you know, you're such, you, you present so much value as an employee that they like want you to work for a really long time. Mm -hmm. So it's not, 
is, you know, you think like I'm a professional athlete. It's about crushing my coworkers. And it's like, no, nah, like we're all going to do well and the company's going to do well. And, you know, like my father-in-law works for a very big company and like they get every federal holiday off, like holidays I'd never even heard yeah. of. And I'm like, oh, what? <laughs> what's the deal? Maybe we should push kids to go work for big companies because it yeah. seems kind of nice. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, honestly, it does seem kind of nice. Like, uh, just waking up every day and knowing exactly what the goal is, is something that's very comforting to me and like working way, way, way harder than anyone ever should work. Like that's very appealing to me. I don't know. Yeah. I guess that probably the, the big problem I have is like, if I'm not super interested yeah. in a project, I tend to be like lazy or find difficulty and motivation on it. But some people just, it's just, you know, like I'm a corporate lawyer and I'm going through documents from 200 years ago, highlighting like references to magazine size. It's like, I couldn't do that. I could not hold focus on that. If I was looking for like Tour de France finishing times from 200 years ago, I'm in. But you just got to find that niche. Yeah, I'm just not able to do that. But if you can, I, by all means, kids, I recommend you go work for the biggest company you can find. It's going to be fabulous. And get health insurance. (laughs) Yeah, get that health insurance. That's what it's about. Yeah. Free lunch. In cycling, it's big. We were mentioning it, like big for you know major cyclists to be podcasters, then like start their own media companies. Is that a thing in running? Not really. I mean, there are some. There are a couple of podcasts now that are like pretty good. A couple of like grassroots media companies that are popping up. One in particular is called Sidious Mag. If you, if anything that I've said in this podcast makes you feel remotely interested in running i i highly recommend signing up for the sidious mag weekly newsletter it's kind of like the spencer's sub stack like you're getting recaps you're getting getting a pulse on on track but just less money less money in track i think it's all going to the coaches it's all going to the coaches (laughs) and the 100 meter sprinters yeah yeah you just you can't really make a living on it there are you can you can commentate some but most people in those roles tend to have several side hustles going on. It is a little funny, yeah. It almost feels like all the money in the, I mean, I guess like the IOC kind of is the big profit center in that value chain or the shoe companies. Like, yeah. Nike's probably doing pretty well. But yeah, it is odd. You don't never see like, there's like not, no one does like, you know, Emma Coburn, what's her season going to look like? And like, actually does like, it's all like, let's run user generated yeah. content that yeah, yeah, might yeah. not be very good where does aisha prot live now yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. it's just like toxic message boards <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but i don't know i feel like puma could just hire you to be like you're, you're just like their roving podcaster you're just traveling the world making running content for them tracking down pro cyclists i also feel like you could like rafa should just hire you to like ride. you're just out there riding like how fast can you get i want to see yeah you're out there riding around the world yeah to your point of your last podcast, I'm a Rafa believer also. I just bought some cargo bib shorts, like the the cushiest possible model that they have. Yeah. Incredible. They Truly are, it, incredible. It is incredible. I think they take a lot of crap because they're owned by like a Walton, the Walton Airs right now. And so it's like not a grassroots company anymore, yeah. but you know, they're, I don't, I don't vividly remember their prices, but I almost feel like their prices have gone down. I think they stayed the same. Prices have gone up. Everything else has gotten yeah. more expensive. It's kind of like North Face. It's like they have a three hundred dollar winter jacket. It's insane, and now like the North Face jacket is yeah. like the budget jacket. Yeah, you can now buy. like Canada Goose exists. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, I have the cargo. I have cargo thermal tights. I never own. I just use like you know tights you'd buy at Dick's Sporting Goods and pull them over bib shorts. Yeah, yeah. It's like a different experience and I can put my phone in there. I don't have to dig it out of my pocket with my gloves on. Yeah. It's an elevated way to live. It's an, it is truly an elevated way to live. Yeah. And the clubhouse in London is really, really fun. I reckon if you're in Soho, in the Soho area, drop in, they have like an entire wall of just like cards you can pull off and like every, each card is a different ride you can do. Oh, cool. It's like a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, I mean, maybe this is just, I just wasn't there long enough, but you know, in the U S it can be a little standoffish. Like you even, you know, I've, I'm often at the Rafa store here, but it's like, if you're not into cycling, you could feel like maybe I'm not supposed to go in there, but like the London store was just like popping. It was like random people That's in really there, like cool. learning about bikes, which was cool. 
even though I'm like a Twitter informant cycling nerd, I feel like an imposter if I'm sitting in Rafa. I coffee. feel like an imposter in Rafa. And what? How? I'd be like <laughs> editing a podcast with Richard Fuga. Like I'm not supposed to be in here. What? That's insane to me. <laughs> I that, but that's the American cycling scene. I feel like it's just all. It's like no one feels like an insider. It's trying to make everyone feel like an outsider. Probably because it was so counterculture and like not cool for so long that it like created this persona. You know, it's like it had it like put this edge on itself out of like a defensive mechanism. But it can be pretty off-putting if you're just curious in the sport. Yeah. Yeah. And probably living in Boulder, too. Like, I, one of my plans in athletics retirement is getting a bike and riding. But as my husband has said, you're a retired professional athlete in one sense, and then you go out to ride, and people think that you're going to be, like, the best, and you're going to, like, crush all these rides and whatever, and and... He's like, whoa, guys, like, I'm just trying to have a good time. <laughs> like, I, <Yeah>. like <laughs> take it easy on me. I'm, I'm new here. But that's how I feel like I want I wanted eventually join all these group rides. But I hear you guys talk about the bus stop ride. And I'm like, I can't go. I there. would not join the bus stop ride. <laughs> 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 that's, that not, that's good. <laughs> that's yeah, not good. Yeah, I said like a gentle, like, I don't know. Is the, the Petunia Mafia is like a 200 plus person female cycling group in Boulder? Like, are like, that's are good. They nice? I feel like they again they take a lot of crap and they're not paying us. But Rafa, like they have really good, uh, they have really good not beginner rides. But I mean they have beginner rides too. But just like it's not crazy. You can go on those rides and they're like they're well, I guess like maintained. And it's especially they have like women's only rides and stuff like that. Like that's a really good entry point into group rides. I mean the bus stop ride, especially before Tokyo was nuts because it was like pro mountain bikers all the pro triathletes and like those were some of the fastest group rides i've ever been on oh my god and like very cool but yeah. unless you're like i was not in great shape that summer and i was like barely able to keep up so like unless you're like really really fit it yeah. can just be overwhelming yeah well, we'll let you go aisha i've kept i've kept you here forever thanks i have to go do my uh studios. my double i've got i've got to do my double too <laughs> aka my single getting on swift <laughs> well thank you so much and thanks for having me we'll have you back on the summer before the olympics to speculate on what class of travel everyone is traveling to the oh olympics yeah in. and we didn't really get into my predictions we didn't get in, into my season predictions into my grand tour predictions i have a lot of thoughts and so uh we'll follow up next time before you go you got to list them off so here i'm gonna monuments milana san ramo flanders roubaix who wins that and then the grand tours mads Pedersen. San Remo. San Remo. Was the second one? Flanders. Flanders. Wow. He has to win it. He does have to win. And then Roubaix. I really don't know. I really don't know. I just fill in wow. Well, yeah. He's got to do it. He he needs both or he's a bum. And then he's doing E3. What's that one called? E3 Sex or something or other? Yeah. I mean, I love wow. Like one of my favorite writers. He'll probably win E3 and then not win Flanders and Roubaix. That would be, he has to win Flanders. He does have to win. Yeah. Man, anyway, sorry. I don't, I don't think Pogacar is doing it. No. Yeah, which is good for Wout. Yeah. And then who wins Euro Tour of Vuelta? Who? Okay. Uh, just because I love him, Wout's girl. I don't think he's gonna win this year, but I'm just gonna speculate that. that I think the fun. tour is gonna be incredible. I think I could see it playing out in a, in a couple of ways. I think I really want to see Primos do incredibly well i just worry that he's not going to be able to stay on his bike without the firepower of having a very protective as many very protective teammates i just feel like he crashes a lot mm. i think what we're going to see is a with the more focused race schedule and Jonas just absolutely annihilate each other and then it's a distant third um probably for primos you think Tade beats Primos even having done the Giro? Yes. Guess that's possible. Or do you think Primos is just has a festering hatred of everyone from what happened at the Vuelta and he is second? Well, probably the the hard truth is Primos just isn't good enough. Like if you go back and watch that Vuelta, like Jonas was better than him. And that was his whole focus on the season. So he's probably not good enough. But I'm like, if you watch the Super Bowl, there was that spoiler alert. There was that punt that like went off the Niners guy's foot Mm -hmm. and the Chiefs got it. I kind of wonder if we're heading towards that type of tour where it's like 
Tade is fatigued. Jonas doesn't have wow. Things don't go as planned and like the C's part and like Primoz yeah. gets to win it. That could be. I I do we talked about this at length that I think that having wow not having wow at the tour is is going to hurt more than they think. I mean, the guy has won the tour for Jonas in the past. Like the amount of times that he's put on his super man cape and saved the day for Jonas, I think is going a little bit too underrated. I agree too. And I find it, I don't know. I don't, we don't know what happened. I find it a little strange that that whole situation, like him not being there says it's for the Olympics. But if you go back, no one's actually won the Olympics without racing the tour. So yeah. what's going on there? And then Volta. I guess it's ridiculous to even speculate because we don't know who's starting. Yeah, we don't know who's starting. Go ahead and pencil in Primos. It's happening. Yeah. He's oh, yeah, yeah. I think I think what will happen is that people are just so fried and Primos crashes out of the tour and wins the Volta. And then, and then Olympics. Wow, for the win. That would be cool. That would be so cool. I mean... It's so uh, hard, though. But Matthew, Matthew Vanderpool is doing both disciplines and he is too fit right now. I mean, just going to call it now. It's too fit. He's very fit right now. Too fit. I mean, the multiple disciplines is crazy too. Apparently, Tom Pickcock is doing the tour, the Olympic mountain bike, and the Olympic road race, which is hilarious. I, I tend to think that it won't be, it won't be Wout, it won't be Vanderpool, it won't be Tade. It will, it's going it's like to be some, someone like Mads Pedersen will win the yeah. Olympics because those guys will be so focused on, but I guess we won't know until it happens. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. And we'll have you back on before the tour so you can you can really dive into your theories you. about what's going to happen. Thank you. I'll be doing some research until then. All right. Thanks, Aisha. Thanks. Thanks.